This prayer comes to us from the Church of Scotland. It's a prayer for Remembrance Day, which is what they call uh, Veterans Day. We call it Veterans Day. They call it Remembrance Day. And uh, uh, I thought it was remarkable in its humanizing uh, uh, spirit. So uh, this is a prayer from the Church of Scotland. Let us in honesty of heart seek the Lord's renewing grace to deepen our wisdom and our peace and to equip us as instruments of God's kindness. Let us pray. God of goodness and truth, we offer our broken spirits for your healing, our searching for your guiding light. God of light and love, you desire that all your people should live in your peace. Grant us the humility to seek your forgiveness and the will to practice it in our dealings with others. Help us in days to come to seek the good of the world, to work for the increase of peace and justice, and to show tolerance and open-mindedness towards those whose character and customs differ from ours. Grant that our remembrance this day may be consecrated for practical service and the world made better for our children's children. Receive our prayers for the well-being of all people, especially those who mourn and are sad, and for all in distress, both known to us and unknown. Hear us for the peace of the world, for the wise resolution of conflicts, and the release of captive and oppressed people everywhere. Grant that the people of the world may do your will and live in your spirit. Amen. Amen. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And <laughs> uh, we're going to start by hearing from uh, some faith leaders. And for that, uh, I uh, I will turn this over first to my friend Ali. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ali Shukoslami. I am one of the board members of the Islam Culture Center of North California. I start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. And assalamu alaikum with the greeting of peace. Dehumanization or demonization of others fuels the worst brutalities that human beings inflict on one another. It is a worldwide problem with deep historical roots. It is a growing problem because of economic inequality, mass migration in response to climate change, the growth of authoritarian politics, and the impacts of social media. Dehumanization makes oppression, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and above all, genocide possible. That is why we should all care about dehumanization and learn how to resist it. Also, it is an important issue to study because we all can dehumanize others. We should not think of those who dehumanize us as monsters. They are human beings like us, and when we dehumanize them, we fall into the same trap. Unless we accept this, and unless we are vigilant, we will be easy prey for dehumanizing propagandists. So what is dehumanization? One of the better definitions and writings on this subject has been done by Dr. David Livingstone Smith, professor of philosophy at New England University. I highly recommend reading his books on the subject, especially on inhumanity, dehumanization, and how to resist it, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. I am borrowing some of his teachings from the book for my talk. Uh, he defines dehumanization as a kind of attitude, a way of thinking about others. To dehumanize another person is, is to conceive of them as subhuman creature. The cruel treatment of others is the result of the dehumanization process. People can dehumanize others without mistreating or describing them in animal-like ways. To dehumanize others is to think of them not merely as inferior human beings, but as subhuman creatures. Dehumanization is both political and psychological, and we must understand both aspects and how they interact. On the psychological level, the beliefs on race lie at the heart of the dehumanizing process. According to the ordinary but totally false conception of race, 
there is some deep defining property of each race, the racial equivalent of an atomic number that is located inside a person and which all and only individuals who belong to the to that race possess. This view of race does not make any scientific sense, and it has a firm, but it has a firm grip on our imagination. Dividing human beings into races, into our kind and their kind, is the first step to the road to dehumanizing them. We first set them apart as different kinds of humans, and only later convert them into subhuman creatures fit to be exterminated or enslaved. Another critical psychological concept that plays a role in dehumanization is the concept of psychological essentialism, which assumes that humans have an essence, and some people do not have that essence, even though they look like humans. From the, hum the humanizer perspective, dehumanized people are subhumans, passing and hu as humans, because their humanness is only skin deep. The political factors are equally important in dehumanization. Dehumanizing beliefs are ideological beliefs, and similar to all ideological beliefs, it aids with oppression. Other important political factors in dehumanization are the use of propaganda by the political leaders through dangerous speech, playing into people's insecurities, and raising demons in people's minds, and then offering fantasies to rescue them from those demons. Powerful social forces interacting with powerful psychological ones produce an attitude to see others as less than human. And once that take root, we can commit acts of atrocity that we would never have imagined ourselves capable of performing. Human beings naturally tend to see others as human beings. The tendency to see them as subhuman creatures is imposed on us by people who have investment in getting us to harm others. To resist demonization, we must take political action against those that perpetuate dehumanization. We must learn about genocide, colonialism, and racial oppression, and resist the temptation to think that we have passed those things behind us. We need to learn the darkest history of our nation, our religion, or ethnic group, and tell others what we have learned. It is important to be mindful that the scene of resistance against dehumanization is not always in the voting booth or a protest march or at the pulpit. Most of our resistance is in everyday life and interaction with each other. Also, the psychological process of dehumanization might be reversed through humanization efforts, the development of empathy, the establishment of personal relationship relationships between conflicting parties and the pursuit of common goods. Unfortunately, during the recent horrific events in Israel and Gaza, we have witnessed and are witnessing dehumanizing language and actions by both Hamas and Israeli leadership. However, there is a massive imbalance of power between Hamas and Israel that makes the dehumanizing language uh, by Israel's leadership very alarming. So much so that yesterday, in an opinion essay in New York Times, Dr. Omar Bartov, a prominent professor of Holocaust and genocide studies at Brown University wrote, quote, it is time for leaders and senior scholars of institutions dedicated to researching and commemorating the Holocaust to publicly warn against the rage and the vengeance filled rhetoric that dehumanizes the population of Gaza and calls for its, for its extinction. Then he continues, if we truly believe that the Holocaust taught us a lesson about the need or really the duty to preserve our own humanity and dignity by protecting those of others, this is the time to stand up and raise our voices before Israel's leadership plunges it and its neighbors into abyss. There is time there is still time to stop Israel from letting its actions become a genocide. We cannot wait a moment longer. When I read this article, I kind of shook to my core last night, and you know, I was on the verge of crying. And because this is does not come, you know, it's coming from an expert on this on this matter on the genocide matter. And finally, I want to share this verse of Quran with you that 
that gives a kind of a view of how we should uh, look at each other and, sh- and should we interact with, with, with each other. It says, O oh people, and you are Yohannas, it says, O oh people, we created you all from a man and a woman. And now, now, now so. that means we are from all from same source. And we made you into nations and tribes so that you should know each other. In God's eyes, the most honor of you are the ones most righteous and mindful of him. God is all knowing, all aware. And this is verse 40, verse 13, chapter 40. And I'm thinking my time is up. So next we're going to hear from Rabbi David, uh, who is, I guess, a, a retired a rabbi for Kahila, but is very still very much involved in the life of their congregation and in the faith trio. Thank you, David. Emeritus, I believe. Yes. Is that how it is? Yeah, basically, okay. it I'm no longer the rabbi and I wasn't fired. <laughs> Great. So during these last few weeks, I've uh, sometimes heard people talking about the Palestinians, the Palestinians. And sometimes I've heard people talking about the Jews. Yes, there are Jews and Palestinians. My issue is with using the direct object, the word the. There's no such thing as the Jews. There's no such thing as the Christians. There's no such thing as the Muslims. There's no such thing as the Arabs. There's no such thing as the Palestinians. And there's no such thing as the Israelis. Each of these groups are made up of a spectrum of people who are different from others in their own group. Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, said that if you can label something, it gives you the power over it, or at least the illusion of power. If you talk about the Palestinians, then you can make claims about whom they are, whom they are, uh, as if they were one simple thing. You can claim to know what they believe, what their intentions are, and then you can decide what you think should be done about them. You can do the same thing with the Jews. They are all privileged, they are greedy, they have no morals, all the Jews are Zionists, all the Zionists hate the Palestinians, or the Jews hate white Christians, and that's why Jews are the real brains behind the Black Lives Matter, because the blacks are not smart enough to do it themselves. All of these are very easy to make up as long as you take and put that direct object in front of the name. And by the way, don't get me started on the Christians. Now, these are the hateful but sometimes unexamined tropes that give you the power to believe that you can slot the other and know all about them when you actually know nothing at all. There is an interesting story in the Torah about how Moses at the burning bush wants God to reduce God's self to a name. He asks, When I go to the people to free them, who should I say sent me? Moses needs a name, a handle, so that he can reduce God to a quantity that is easier to understand, or rather, easier to misunderstand. God tries to avoid and replies, I become whatever I become, or I am that I am. Eh, yeah, I share eh, yeah. So, if it's true for God, then it's certainly true for us. We are complex communities made up of complex individuals. I don't know the Palestinians. I know Tariq, Eid, and Auda, whose village is being terrorized by settlers right now. I don't know the Iranian Americans. I know Ali and Mernoush. I don't know the Christians. I know Reverend Ben and Betsy. I don't know the Israelis. I know Timna and Abraham who are scared for their kibbutz and for their young children, who, for their young adults who may be conscripted into this conflict. Not knowing people is a very convenient way to believe that you understand them. Let me repeat that. Not knowing people is a very convenient way to believe that you understand them when you don't. When you do know them, the stories are so much more complicated and more human. And that's really the origin of the faith trio. 9-11 happened, 
and we could have allowed our stereotypes to go wild. For over two decades, we have, uh, let me say this again, for over two decades, we have not, uh, we have come not just to know each other, but to know how much more we don't yet know as we remain together and as we continue to learn from each other. And so as we get to know each other, we get to know how much we don't know about each other and we continue. This pursuit actually will never end because we find each other in our depths rather than in our surface. So thank you. Back again? I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much, Rabbi David. And now our third speaker uh, will be uh, our pastor at uh, Montclair Presbyterian Church, Reverend Ben. And uh, please spotlight him because it's his turn now to speak. So, um, as I was thinking about this theme, how do we oppose? demonization and affirm our common humanity in the face of hate and violence, I found myself doing what, what Ali said we should never do, which is I drifted over to Facebook. It's a common problem I have when I have writer's block. But there I was doing what I shouldn't do. Uh, I mean, ordinarily, I would agree with that. I would say stay away from Facebook and all other social media while trying to write anything of importance. But God works in mysterious ways and and when I went to Facebook, I saw that someone had posted a meme on Facebook, which was a quote from Aldous Huxley. It's from his book, The Olive Tree, which came out in 1938. And, and the quote is this, the propagandist purpose, wrote Huxley, the propagandist purpose is to make one set of people forget that certain other people are human. And that quote struck me as being astute. Though it was written almost 90 years ago, it, it seems to describe what I'm seeing in the world of media these days. We are being inundated with suggestions that certain people are less human than others. Now, no one comes right out and says this directly, but I have seen a proliferation of social media posts which, for example, depict Israeli Jews marching and calling for the complete annihilation of all Palestinians as if all Israelis or even all Jews were ravenously genocidal. And in more mainstream media, I have seen Palestinian, Palestinians presented in a way that makes them seem almost invisible and therefore less human. When Israelis are harmed, the Western media almost always names the victims and shows their pictures, as well they should. But Palestinian victims of Israeli violence are much less likely to be named are or shown when when American citizens were victims of Hamas unforgivable attack on October 7th we knew about it but it took a little while for the media to mention that there were hundreds of American citizens stuck in Gaza because the propaganda presented by the media won't work if we know that a lot of the Palestinians are American citizens just as a lot of Israelis are also American citizens in the same way I saw a lot of photographs and and heard a lot of biological details about folks who had been kidnapped by Hamas. And those photos and those stories broke my heart, as well they should have. But I've seen nary a photo and heard few stories about hundreds of Palestinian youths held in Israeli jails without being charged or tried. So one way to avoid the sin of dehumanization, I think, is to pay attention to when someone is feeding us propaganda. Propaganda can show up on your social media feed or it can come over the airwaves, even from news sources that are otherwise trustworthy. Sometimes, sometimes propaganda originates from the workshops of shady internet trolls, and sometimes it comes from very official government sources. So we have to be on our toes. We have to ask ourselves whether what we're reading, what whenever we're reading something or listening to the news or whatever, we have to ask. Is this story or news item making anyone seem less than human? And in so doing, is it justifying warfare? And if the answer to either or both of those questions is yes, then we're probably being exposed to propaganda. Don't buy into it. And sometimes the dehumanization of propaganda is less direct. As I was doing the research necessary to verify that it actually was Aldous Huxley who said that the propagandist purpose is to make one set of people forget that the other sets of people are human. When I was researching that, I came across another quote by Huxley, this one from his book, Passivism and Philosophy. And it goes like this, all war propaganda 
consists in the last in resorting to, to substituting diabolical abstractions for human beings. Similarly, those who defend war have invented a pleasant sounding vocabulary of abstraction in which to describe the process of mass murder. These words sound about right to me. The dehumanizing propaganda that surrounds us tells us, for example, that collateral damage is unavoidable in war. But what they really mean is that killing innocent people is an acceptable thing to do, only they would never consider it an unfortunate inevitability if it was their own loved one who ended up being the collateral damage. In the same way, anyone is serving up dehumanizing propaganda who says terrorism is a natural outcome when people have been long subjected to grave injustice. After all, the United States has done and is doing all sorts of heinous stuff around the world. And if in response to American evil, someone committed an act of terrorism in my neighborhood, I would not be saying it's okay because the United States is, you know, a colonialist power that exploits the developing world without remorse and separates parents from their children at the, at the border. As awful as the United States can be, that would not be an excuse for a terrorist attack here in Oakland. And if a terrorist lived across the street from me, I would not be okay with the U.S. Army destroying every house on my block to make sure that one terrorist didn't do any harm to others. Now, obviously, right? This is true. Yet the propaganda we get every day would suggest otherwise. Some of this propaganda suggests that terrorism is justified because Israel has mistreated Palestinians. Other propaganda suggests, for example, that it's okay to bomb a hospital if terrorists have dug tunnels under the hospital and are hiding down in those tunnels. It's all dehumanizing propaganda because it suggests that some lives are expendable. But our faith traditions tell us otherwise. Our faith traditions remind us that every life is precious. And that's what we need to remember. That is the truth we need to publish abroad. And this is not the only way to avoid dehumanizing others, but as one way. Be on the lookout for propaganda. And when you see propaganda, know what it is you're looking at. Don't be swayed by it. And for heaven's sake, don't pass it along to others as the truth. Thanks. Betsy, I think you're muted. I am so sorry. I keep forgetting this. Um, so now we're going to be preparing to have our own time to, to talk about our thoughts and feelings about this topic. And before we go into the breakout rooms, um, Reverend Ben is going to uh, present the questions and explain about them. And then I will give some guidelines on how we feel um, our time together would be in a positive way. So first we'll hear the questions and then I'll let you know how, it's, how to behave and then we'll start. Okay, so the, the, the questions are here uh, before you, and um, we uh, we understand that you everybody in the in the breakout room may not have an opinion about all these questions, or some people in the breakout room may have too many opinions about, about all of these questions. And so, what we hope you'll do is is look at the questions and and uh, uh, feel free to answer the questions which most prompt your soul. Uh, it can be one question, it can be all the questions, but it's it's just important that um, we make space for everybody. And, and, and Betsy, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about the process here. Um, but you might want to take a take that uh, take these these questions down. I'm going to um, just take a picture of my screen right now with my camera so that I have them. And you could do something similar uh, so that you you have them and, and are, are, are able to reference them uh, during the conversation. But Betsy, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the process here? Yes. Okay, so if we could move to the, uh, did you want to read the questions? Oh, sure, I'll read the questions, yeah. Wait, let's read them. Uh, they yeah. will be in the chat, um, mm -hmm. and so that people can refer back to them. As as Ben has said, um, we're not expecting people to answer all of them. We, we put a number of them up so that you could choose 
um, which, uh, you know, kind of resonate more with what you want to say, or you could say something about all of them. Yeah. So let me just read the questions really quick. Uh, how do we oppose dehumanization? So that's the, that's the theme. So have you ever experienced or observed dehumanization? How do we affirm our common humanity in the face of hate and violence? How have you been able to build a bond with a person or people from other communities than your own? So those are the those are the um, those are the questions. How do we oppose dehumanization? How do you have you personally experienced or observed dehumanization? How do we affirm our community, our common humanity in the face of hate and violence? And how have you been able to build a bond with a person or people from other communities than your own? So go ahead, Betsy. Thank you. Okay, so if we could have the slide now of our um, guidelines. Um, I want to say a few things before I go over those. Um, I have taken this from a group that uh, does international work with um, universal religions uh, and working on what we're doing here with the Faith Trio. And one of the things that they are um, impressing upon us is that you will only be speaking from your own experience, not from or for anyone else. And we want to watch for phrases like everyone knows, or we all know, or of course, or you. And listen with respect. You don't have to agree or believe what someone else is saying to listen with respect. And we want to listen for understanding, not necessarily for agreement. We want to discover and explore. We want to listen for patterns and themes. We want to notice what's being said and not be sp spending all, all our time thinking about what we're going to say. Basically, speak from your heart. Use I statements that convey your feelings and your thoughts. So now for the actual guidelines that, that we have listed here, we want to be sure that everyone mutes themselves while the other person is speaking. One will speak at a time. Listen respectfully with an open heart. Wait until it's your turn to speak. Do not use your time to reply to what someone else said, but to say what is true for yourself. And again, use I statements. I think this or I feel this. What is said in the breakout rooms stays in the breakout rooms. There's some confidentiality that is expected. But if what you learn, uh, please take it with you. It leaves with you. It's so a lot of interesting people's experiences and learned from each other. Uh, and we only have a little bit of time now. Um, it was suggested that I read a statement that our committee, the couple of representatives from each of our congregations work that together. Um, every month we talk about things and plan things like this. And because of the events uh, that have happened since October 7th, uh, we took some time amongst ourselves to come up with a statement. And I would like to read that now to you. I'm um, just to say that this statement really comes from us in the committee as individuals, rather than representing each of our congregations, although mm -hmm. many people in our congregations might agree with us. This is mm -hmm. our statement. And yeah. it comes from our process of being there facing each other. Yeah. Okay. So it's, this is a simple statement from our hearts, October 2023. We are members of the Faith Trio group composed of people of three faiths, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian. We are members from the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California, Kahila Community Synagogue, and Montclair Presbyterian Church. We are writing as individuals rather than as representatives of our congregations. We speak as colleagues in this coalition that has persisted for over 20 years, where we have celebrated together, mourn together and learn together. We know that we are not separated by our faiths. In this time of horrid violence in Israel and Palestine, we remain united in our affirmation that violence cannot end violence. War crimes cannot justify war crimes. Enmity cannot nurture peace 
and that every life is a gift of the divine and each of us is in the image of God, Allah, Elohim. Teachings in the Jewish, Islamic, and Christian traditions teach us that the value of a single human life is beyond measure. For example, in almost identical language, the Talmud and the Holy Quran affirm that to kill a human being is to kill an entire world. The killing must stop immediately. The United States must use its power to stop and not fuel the violence. We also know that without justice, there is no peace. Without peace, there is no justice. We affirm that the Palestinian people and the Israeli people must have peace, justice, security, and self-determination. And this cannot be secured by violence, occupation, or expulsion. We will support whatever arrangements of sovereignty would secure these ends. We continue to mourn all who are killed on every side of this violence. And we pledge to affirm our common humanity and to stay united in community to affirm and to seek peace and justice. Okay, thank you. So it's, we have three minutes, um, which is just enough time for our final prayer. Uh, and I was not, um, I, I need to ask the host if uh, Rabbi Bresner is here from uh, Temple Sinai. Has she come? She is, and she is being spotlighted. Oh, excellent. There you go. I'll wait till I see myself spotlit, <laughs> spotlighted. There we go. Great. Wonderful. Um, thank you for coming. Of course. Thank you for having us. And uh, it's wonderful to be here in community. Um, I want to first just thank everyone who put together this event. Um, and thank you all who uh, brought such thoughtfulness to the setup of this event. Um, I want to close um, with, I think, a, a important teaching from Jewish tradition that I think is very relevant for all of our faith traditions or non-traditions. Um, this idea that comes from a teaching in Pirkei Avot, which is a set of Jewish teachings that we call the ethics of our ancestors is what Pirkei Avot translates to. And it's the idea, um, we learn this in chapter two, verse five, where it says, Bimakom she'en anashim lishtadel lihiot ish, lishtadel lihiot ish, which means in a place where no one is human, where there are no humans, strive to be, strive to act as a human. And um, it feels so important in this time when we come with different backgrounds, we come with different experiences, we might disagree on what terms mean, but most importantly, to see one another as human. And I think that that is such an important teaching and such an important uh, part of being a person of faith is to see others. And I think, unfortunately, as we talked about in our breakout room, so often we are, and, and as all the speakers shared, right, we are we are leaning into generalizations and leaning into um, seeing those who may disagree with us as the worst version of themselves. So my prayer, my hope, um, to begin with the words, Misha Berach, Avotenu Vimotenu, may the one who blessed our ancestors bless each of us with the strength and the hope to believe that there are better days ahead to believe that one-on-one -on -one conversation and truly listening to one another is the way to make change and to lead to a better world that we will be proud to stand by and stand with one another in. And with that, I say thank you again, all of you. Go in peace. And may we see those better days soon. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And now um, I'd like to... Also, I uh, say to go in peace and have courage. We have a saying in our church about um, having, you know, go to go to go out into the world in peace. And I uh, wish you the best, all of you. Anyone that wants to get in touch with us, um, please reach out. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about tonight and about some things that we might do together in the future okay thank you so much thank you